Good afternoon. My name is Dennis George, and I'm the panel leader of this panel discussion, proudly sponsored by um, Business Report and Sunny Touch. And our discussion is going to focus specifically on the budget speech that was delivered by the Minister of Finance and how the different social partners can find practical solutions and ways to take forward to implement these particular solutions, specifically with a focus on achieving higher inclusive economic growth, employment creation, and prosperity for South Africans. And I would like to introduce our panel um, to you, um, starting first with Adri Seneca, who's the editor of the Business Report, and then also um, Zandili Zungu, um, who is the president of the Black Business Council, and uh, my good friend, Professor Raymond Parsons from the Northwest University Business School. And welcome to all the participants, and uh, good morning. Thank good you. Morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So the Minister of Finance have now released a budget yesterday in a very um, situation where the country was facing huge headwinds. And uh, we're going to start off with asking Professor Parsons just to give us an overview on the economic outlook in the context of which the budget was stipulated. And uh, Professor Parsons, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I think to understand the challenges that our Minister of Finance has faced in framing this particular budget, we just need to remind ourselves of the important markers that he had to deal with over the past year. A year ago, we had the then, then main budget, where he had some warnings about the recession in which we already found ourselves and the fiscal challenges that were arising from it already then. Uh, we had, of course, the junk status announcement that month. Then came the pandemic. Then in June, we had a supplementary budget which was the right thing to do in, in the sense of bringing our public finances up to date in the light of what it had to be done between March and June in terms of economic support measures and dealing with the economic consequences of the lockdown. And then we had, of course, the so-called mini budget in October, where once again, he warned us of what we were facing as an economy and from a fiscal point of view. So with that background, I think one can look at what was said yesterday in a much more positive light, because what has happened in the past few months has enabled and empowered the minister to come with somewhat better economic and indeed fiscal news uh, in this main budget. Why is this so? Well, firstly, because we've had improvements in the global economy, which have had spin-off for our commodity prices, which have been very good. So that's been a positive factor. Uh, there has been a favorable court decision on the important public sector wage bill, uh, which we will come back to, I think, later. And then thirdly, there's been a rebound in our economy as our lockdown exit strategy has been implemented, or despite that, that interruption which we had over the Christmas season uh, of reverting uh, to, to lockdown three. The fact is that we can look to a rebound in our economy this year uh, of perhaps about 3%. Um, he thinks it might be 3.3, but I think uh, what's a decimal point between his friends? Uh, it's around about 3%. And with that has come uh, an unexpected recovery in the tax revenues. So against that background, he was able to produce quite a balanced budget which embodies certain, certain trade-offs, of course, um, and nonetheless is saying, look, if you take a snapshot picture of where we are, I've got some better news to offer. I can keep taxes unchanged virtually, except for the so-called sin taxes and indeed the fuel taxes, which we'll also no doubt come back to. But on the whole, he's saying, look, although I'm pushing out the deadline at which I hope to be able to reverse our adverse uh, debt to GDP ratio until 2025, I think I'm getting the situation under control. Now, I think this outlook, however, we must understand, and I think we need to interrogate these issues, is based on certain assumptions. The margin for error is not great. It's assuming that the growth forecasts are indeed uh, very persuasive, 
and will be realized not just this year, but over the next few years. And secondly, that the tax revenues will come in as a result of that, and we can collect the taxes we have to collect. And thirdly, of course, that, that we will see a growth in our private fixed investment. That's tremendously important because I come back to the snapshot picture. I think the snapshot picture looks good, but what's important now is what is there in the budget that supports what must lie beyond this year? In other words, our growth in, in 2022, 23, because a huge number of things, including employment, tax revenues, business confidence, hinges not only on what will turn out to be good this year, but what will turn out to be better next year and beyond. So the important debate has got to be, yes, how do we unpack the snapshot picture? What are the positive elements? What are some of the downsides? But the other point is, what lies beyond this year? How has the balance of risks for South Africa's economic outlook shifted as a result of this particular budget and the decisions that it embodies. And coming back to an analogy used by, uh, by the minister himself, have we, are we succeeding in closing those hippo jaws? I think that's, that's where we are now. And I think that revolves around the credibility of what has been said. Uh, and it actually lies beyond the numbers. It lies beyond the credibility of the message. And I think as, Everyone has agreed, and I think one saw this implied in the speech itself, that we have to walk the talk. We have to say, this is what we intend to do, and now we intend to do it in collaboration with the private sector. That was another important message that came through, uh, that we must move ahead together, but that mustn't be an excuse for not getting on with it. We mustn't mistake movement for action. And I think what the country, what business, what labor wants is to see action. We want to see some near-term wins that build confidence and say, yes, some things will take time, but we're moving in the right direction in a visible, tangible way. And I think that is what has got to come out of this budget speech if it's not going to just be dismissed as, as another snapshot picture that's not going to take us anywhere. So I think the important thing is to build on this budget that things will look different and better next year and the year after so that we can meet those targets uh, that we've set from, from, from the deficit point of view because there's a limit to what you can do with, with your fiscal consolidation. There are limits there. Uh, the, you start then starting to cut into the muscle and not into the fat. And I think that, that's very important that we now see that growth, growth is the medium and longer term way we've got to go. And in what ways does this budget help us to promote the investment and the job rich growth that we want to see over the next few years? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Parsons, for that opening remarks. And we're still going to come back to some other points that you've raised. But Adri, um, as editor, you know, you've got this uh, woman touch, you know, and we know this whole budget is actually dependent on our frontline workers. It's those workers that is now helping us to save a lot of our people, you know, in the hospitals and, and so on. Um, maybe you can shed a bit of light because that is one of the critical assumptions that we base our budget. And then after that, I'm going to come to Sandili, to, you know, to talk a little bit about the infrastructure investments and the budgets that govern and how that will link to black economic power. Adri? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dennis. Now, I fully agree with you, and I'm very excited about, you know, the amount of money that's been set aside to, to really take care of our frontline workers. As we all know, it's 20 billion rand of the vaccines program that's been, um, for the vaccines that's been uh, allocated. But as, as, as editor um, of, of the business unit, I normally watch the markets very closely. And the reaction of the RAND, uh, which is actually our country share price, if you think about listings of Africa on a global stock exchange, that is our share price. And the reaction of the RAND uh, was slightly strong during the budget speech, and it showed some positive investor confidence. Um, and all the economists that I spoke to last night agreed that the budget was very good for the markets under the current circumstances. The economy, as uh, Professor Parson also elaborated on, appeared to be recovering faster than we all expected, in line with global with the global economic growth. 
I think it's for the first time in six years that we have such a good uh, growth expectation. And that's also a very positive signal um, to investors and obviously to the rating agencies. So overall, a positive budget that will be good for the nominal bond outlook. Our bonds uh, traded very strong this morning after the, after the budget. I'm also excited uh, about the 790 billion rand allocated towards infrastructure. It's for the upgrade of our dams, and I think our other panelists will, uh, will speak about that. And yeah, um, back to the public-private partnership agreement, which I was very delighted about. I'm exceptionally uh, ex excited about fixing our border post because that's got a very positive impact on our inter-Africa trade. Just a little point that I want to make is, um, you know, on, on, on the size of the government. And I want to put this to the panel maybe a little later on, but do we really need a separate ministry for state-owned enterprises? I feel strong about this. We've got a minister for, for energy and uh, agriculture and communications and so on. So I'm not sure who, who's reporting to who here. Does all the, um, do all the um, ministers report to uh, Minister Praveen or do they report directly to, uh, to the president? Another point that I would like to raise, and we can discuss it a little bit later, is the, the cost of all the consulting firms. Um, just before the webinar, I had a very interesting discussion with, with an economist that um, alerted me to the fact that uh, you know, the cost of these consulting firms as patent, a percentage of our BVP is really, it's quite big. It's bigger than, than we think. And then just on the formation of, a, of the state bank, I alerted that in my um, communicate to you. I think the minister will share some light on this in the near future. But my take on this is that we already got a state bank. If we merge the assets of the land bank, the development bank, and possibly the post office, we've got everything in our, in our um, portfolio to, uh, to form a proper state bank. So Dr. Dennis, this is uh, some points that I would like to raise and over to the panel. Yeah. Um, President of um, Black Business Council, um, Mr. Sandili and Ms. Sungu, um, infrastructure investment is very important for any country to grow as a platform from energy, from your roads, from your ports, from all those things, because that will make the country more competitive. Are you comfortable with what the government have announced? And, and, and will we make sure that our Black uh, brothers and sisters you know, that has previously been excluded from participating in the economy, can meaningful participate and also become and make the economy more inclusive? Well, um, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. George. Uh, first, I must um, thank uh, Business Report for inviting the BBC to participate in this panel discussion and, um, and good morning to my fellow panelists as well. And um, my point of departure will be the ministers in highlighting hope as a center um, for, for the budget. Uh, and I think there's a couple of uh, hope markers. I'll get to the issue of infrastructure right now. Uh, there's a couple of uh, hope markers which um, really would have impressed uh, me, uh, impressed the Black Business Council and uh, I hope uh, more South Africans on the budget itself. Um, while it was quite impressive to see that uh, uh, South Africans will not be uh, taxed more, especially the corporates in South Africa will have felt that um, they are generally overtaxed uh, relative to uh, their peers in other economies which are uh, 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 scrambling for growth. Um, the high net worth individuals uh, would have felt the almost like hated individuals. Uh, there's the perpetual talk about wealth tax, but when you look at uh, the taxes that they pay, VAT, uh, uh, dividend withholding tax, uh, capital gains tax, as well as um, you know just PAYE, they would have felt look. Uh, bearing uh, the biggest brunt of uh, the tax burden. They're not being encouraged to do to, that. To, to. So the, the minister spoke about um, uh, not additional taxes, except for excise duty on, on what are called syntax. 
I think that that to me was uh, hope because what South Africa needs in the current environment is hope. Um, and the fact that, uh, you know, the minister speaks about the tourism um, equity fund, uh, which obviously was launched a couple of weeks ago and talks about allocation from a uh, treasury. Um, look, it, it, it enhances hope, especially among the township entrepreneurs. We also remember, most of the township entrepreneurs, uh, when they enter business, uh, they would be either in tourism or hospitality um, or some services. You know? So when the government says <clears throat> we, we're putting, setting aside 600 million rands uh, as a start um, towards alleviating your plight, that's very good. That's a, that's a very good start. Um, I think it enhances the hope for the entrepreneurial uh, sector. And if you look at the infrastructure um, investment, getting to, to that issue, um, a, an economy which wants to grow in future um, demonstrates its commitment to the future by investing in infrastructure. Not only is infrastructure critical, um, to employment, especially among the low-skilled people, again, hope. Um, because especially the, the, the roads uh, will tend to utilize uh, the local people who are less skilled uh, to do this and that. Um, need that sense of dignity among South African people. Mm -hmm. No one wants to provide for his family by queuing for a social grant. Everyone wants to come back with a loaf of bread that he's worked for. Um, it's important for that kind of dignity. It's all of those small gains that are important for social cohesion in this country and to rebuild the fiber of, um, of South African society. So when you look at budget, it must not just be about numbers. It must also be how does a budget contribute to social cohesion? How does a budget contribute towards um, the, the, the well-being uh, of South African people. I think there were many elements uh, to this budget. Of course, the biggest bugbear um, to South Africa is implementation. When you look at infrastructure, the biggest question for black entrepreneurs will be, to what extent are we gonna participate? Um, to what extent are we gonna be the main patrons for implementation rather than being brought on board, uh, screaming and kicking for 25% uh, 20, BE share. Uh, to what extent can they be real principles? Because you will not have the South Africa transforming fundamentally if we're still going to be stuck to this, I want a BE partner. Why can't BE people be, be the principles? Why cannot uh, they be the uh, black construction companies be responsible for building the dam? Um, why not? Uh, are we doubtful that they can build a dam? Uh, are we doubtful that they can build a, a, a road link in big cities? Are we doubtful that they can install fiber um, and, and therefore uh, give true meaning to this smart city concept? Um, I hope not. Uh, then they must be trusted with the responsibility of leading on this infrastructure charge. Because when it comes to implementation, I'm afraid um, we may be back to square one where 800 billion rands, that's earmarked for infrastructure, when a review is done, uh, all of it went to white companies. Um, I think that's the, that to me is, is a major issue. And also, uh, I liked what I said um, about bringing in public-private uh, partnership into the mix of infrastructure build. What is very important, everyone knows that South, South, South African government or just governments in general, the world over, are very bad at contracting. That's why you have major cost overruns. That's why you have malfeasance always associated with infrastructure build. Uh, so it's very important to bring the private sector to mobilize private capital. So this private private, uh, sorry, uh, the, the triple P model. Um, we've got to uh, fight for it to be brought into the center and with, um, with the, the black participants not left behind. 
So I, I just want to focus on that um, as some of the, the positive hope marks uh, to the budget. Dennis, could I perhaps add to that? Because I think Sandini has made some very important points uh, and emphasizing the exciting part of the budget is the renewed emphasis on infrastructural development because it fits into the overall strategy that the government needs to shift from its consumption spending to its investment spending. In other words, infrastructural spending must go up, the wage bill must go down. That's really the balance that you're seeking. And it's important here because it will underpin the point I made earlier. We've got to look beyond this year. Now, you're not going to create all this overnight, but because you can't, you must start now. And a lot of this infrastructure must be put in place now so that you can reap the fruits of it next year and the year after to underpin the rebound and make sure that the rebound doesn't become a dead cap bounce. In other words, you want this infrastructure investment together with private investment to begin to underpin your growth. It also adds to the point that you want to create jobs, you want job rich development. And what's important here as part of the overall strategy is you want to gradually by growing the economy in this way, move people out of welfare into work because quite clearly the welfare commitments are growing. They have to be met because there is real hardship out there, but it's not a long-term sustainable solution. Even the number of people who are now receiving grants will grow by large numbers over the next year. And the only way you can do this is to get investment, both, both public and private, moving rapidly. And finally, the import which has been made only at the moment, my own numbers tell me that about 2% of infrastructural spending is driven by, by public-private sector partnerships. This is way below the global standards. Now, it will never, it'll never be a majority because a lot of this infrastructure, we call, them, we call them public goods. They can only be created by the government, but they can have support and financing from the private sector. And we've got to develop the culture and remove the obstacles to, to the public-private sector partnerships as an important component in expediting efficient infrastructural development. So I want to support very much what, what has been said, because I think this is a very important component of sustained economic growth, getting beyond 2021 and holding out the promise that those growth rates that we want to see beyond 2021 will indeed be realized. Just to come back to the one issue that the Sandili was talking about, the issue of hope, and hope is linked to trust, and trust is linked to partnerships. And the government made a bigger issue in the budget speech about Operation Villandela. Um, the government is now saying, and Adri also touched on the subject, you know, who is in charge of what, and it looks like government wants to move. And Zandili is very close to this whole process because he's also the leader of the social partners. Um, are, are you comfortable, Zandili, how um, um, business is also playing a role in that particular whole operation to deal with the state and enterprises and implementation? Thank you. I think that's a very important question. Um, if, if you listen to the budget speech, and um, you, you almost like you, you trap the South African mood um, in that uh, 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 chamber. You will swear that we're a country uh, uh, that is humming with opportunities, that is really moving very fast. And add to that the market response um, to the budget, uh, albeit. Uh, for a few hours, it performs exceptionally well, and then it dies down, but still growth uh, for the day and the, 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 the RAND performance. Uh, you would actually say that this country is, is, is really humming, but the reality is that we still have very high unemployment rate. Um, and your reality, to address your question specifically, there's still a massive trust deficit between uh, government and business, government and labor, and labor and business. So this issue of a trust deficit 
in a society which is in crisis, in a society that needs to uh, harmonize relationships among social partners, that needs to ensure that we are all aligned in the right direction, is very critical. Um, but as matters stand right now, we are still at that uh, the stage where there is a massive past deficit. Uh, for example, when, just, let's just cite one example. Um, there is talk that money must be mobilized from uh, private sector to, to provide um, vaccines. Um, other social uh, partners are up in arms. Why must it be mobilized from the private sector? Um, not, not because they are saying government, are you saying you've got no money? No, because they don't trust that a uh, process which is funded by the private sector um, will necessarily uh, be equitable um, in terms of uh, distribution. Uh, fundamentally, that's what it is. Um, and uh, while I was, I was uh, deeply touched, and I'm sure South Africans will be deeply touched by the Minister of Finance being gung-ho, uh, we have the money to fund the vaccines. And by the way, we have the, the, the further reserves should the crisis uh, deepen uh, to fund on a supplementary basis and on an urgent and emergency basis the issue of vaccines. So that kind of commitment towards um, the public health coming from the minister himself is very important for the confidence of South Africans. And I'm afraid um, on the issue of um, what needs to be done with state-owned enterprises, there is no convergence, there is no a shared view um, between business and, and, and government. The issue of ESCOM being one case in point, um, the role of uh, uh, private um, you know, uh, power producers vis-a-vis um, -vis the supply to the grid. Um, for example, how much money needs to come from government to rescue SAA uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the how many -th time? Um, again, that depends the kind of uh, trust deficit. So I'm afraid we're back to square one. Uh, beyond the hype, uh, beyond the euphoria uh, around the balanced budget, uh, which was an expansive budget as opposed to austerity, um, which everyone welcomed, uh, we're still back to square one. That there's a massive trust deficit um, among the social partners in the country as to what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. Uh, and compounded by that um, is the fact that uh, uh, black business still feels, broadly speaking, uh, left out of um, the drive for solutions. Um, and the, the central role of, um, you know, the search for solutions. It feels left out by and large. I would just like to add to that, that the important point that's been emphasized, when we get beyond the technicalities of the budget, we are also dealing with the issue of, of social cohesion, of investing in social capital. Now, that's, of course, been institutionalized in a structure like DEDLAC, and that's playing a very important role. Uh, I myself have been involved there for, for indeed many years. But there comes a point also uh, where one can say that NEDLAC doesn't govern the country. It helps to keep it governable. That's, that's quite important. At some point, someone has to grasp the nettle and say, this is the trade-off we're going to make. I think we began to see some of that in the budget yesterday. But nonetheless, it is by working together and working out as far as you can a, a sort of common vision of what the problems are and how they might be solved that I think is tremendously important in building social cohesion, not only at the macro level. I think we tend, of course, in these debates to talk in the big picture. But I think at the micro level, I think of, of what Indeed, the minister said about local government, which is the government closest to us, where we have huge delivery problems. So when we talk about social cohesion and building social capital, it mustn't only be top down, it must also be bottom up. And I think that's the culture we've got to develop. And the important point here also is these trade-offs become easier to deal with when you have an expanding economy, when you've got some more resources that you can invest also 
in the social capital processes so that by starting to deliver results, you then also build trust. And that comes back to political world leadership, the commitment by the social partners. It's a complex, we sit here, we simplify it. It is complex, but it needs to be done. And I think one of the implicit messages of the budget speech, insofar as it fell within the remit of the National Treasury, is to say, this cannot rest only on the shoulders of the National Treasury. This is a collective issue in the cabinet, in the presidency, with the social partners. And although it's difficult, and though sometimes we may take three steps forward and two steps back, at the end, we're all in the same boat. And I think what's important is we, if we're going to build towards solutions and we're to build towards a bigger, stronger and better economy, we're going to have to understand that we have to, we have to close that, that, that trust deficit, not overnight, but gradually by not giving up. And as, as both the minister and Zandidi had said, hope that we can turn this round, that we have, we have the capacity if we have the will. And that applies not only to, to the government, but also to other stakeholders. And that's the, one of the most important messages that must not only come over at the, at the macro level, with which we tend to be heavily uh, in the headlines of the macro picture, which is very important. But I think we need to give more attention to the micro level, to the sectors and the local government, where a lot of things can, can be done in a productive way. And I think that was one of the messages that came through in, in the budget speech, that we need to give more attention to what we can do about the government that is closest to us, namely the local government, where a lot of the delivery challenges, in fact, are embedded. Thank you. Adri, um, both past the, um, um, Professor Parsons and Mr. Sandili, um, and Sungu have spoken about the issue of trust, you know, the deficit that there is in trust. But, 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 but you've got a very powerful portfolio because you are the, the editor of one of the business reports which covers us nationally. I mean, how, how does the media from your side, you know, like you're now today educating the people regarding the budget, can you help us to take this process of implementation of the budget and the goals forward? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dennis, uh, for that question. Um, since I've been appointed at Business Report, um, we've really focused a lot of um, voicing, getting the voices and the feedback from, from entrepreneurs, black business. Uh, as you very well know, my passion for uh, um, opinion pieces and so on. Um, what, what, I, what I've seen over the last couple of months actually is that this you know there's this cloud around uh, township economies which i feel is almost belittling those companies and i think it should we should rename it um if you go to a bank and Sandili help me out here and you say i'm gonna start a business in uh in the township whatever, whatever, whatever it is you almost have to pay more you're not being trusted and so on so I think that that to me is like a little bit of um, we see in Afrikaans a bitter pull on the slack. Uh, I think we need to really unpack that. There's a lot of focus um, on township economic development, um, which I fully support, of course. I mean, there's so many success stories, and that's the point we actually want to make. Uh, the role of the media is also, I mean, we can all go for the headlines and all the corruption cases and all of that, which is part of you know being a newspaper. But what about the success stories? What about that guy that started a movie theater in Kalicha? Uh, Linda Sengoli, who opened a, a chocolate factory shop. Today, she's exporting chocolates that beats Lind chocolates any day. We don't, I don't say we don't, well, I try to, and my team, but we, we also are guilty of not being ambassadors for our own country and utilize our fantastic various media platforms to, to bring out the good news stories. While I was listening to, to our esteemed panel, I thought about foreign direct investment, and we all know that we need foreign direct investment, like the Ford uh, plant that they invested in. And the other thing that I want to mention is also the industrial development zones. 
um, visit those industrial development zones. It allows for a lot of opportunities. You get tax rebates and all of those things. But those, you know, what our readers want, and I say that with a lot of respect to my competitors, we don't try, business support is not for the CEOs. Business support is for the man in the street. That's why, that's what we are focusing on. What my readers want is where to, where do I go to get a loan? What do I have to do? Those kind of practical, practical news, practical information. People don't want news. You get news on everywhere. People need information. And that is what we try to give our people. And the media plays a critical role. Um, and I love what Professor Parson said earlier on. Uh, it is about communicating. It's about communicating the successes. It's about communicating uh, via this webinar and so on. So there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot that we can do more. Um, but please, I want to invite specifically the Black Business Council to, to, to join, to partner with us. Dr. George knows me very well. Let's have a joint effort. Let's bring out the good news stories. If one person can start a abuse group or a theater uh, in Kailicha, it gives hope. And that's what I love what you say, Sandili. Gives hope. If that person can do that, I can do that. If a person can start a sub factory, many years ago I was with the, the business place Copper with Dr. Dr. Survey. And um, it was amazing. A guy walked in there the one day and he said he's producing soap. And I introduced him to the one and only. And I said, guys, this guy makes soap in his garage. What about you as the one and only? Give this guy a chance and have a little story with that so that our international tourists read that story and even they can buy that soap. Now it's a very, it's a very, it's, it's one example of many others that I've got, but that gives me hope. If we can have more and more of those, we will be better ambassadors for our own country. We are waiting for the amorphous writing agencies to write us. Well, we are the worst ambassadors for our own country. We speak negative, we are sitting on the couch and we all complain, whatever. But what is it that we do from, on, on a daily basis to contribute actively to build this country and build our economy. Sorry, Dr. Dennis, I'm getting very passionate here, as you can see. <laughs> I, can see I can see you getting very emotional. But one of the most important things that, that the Minister of Finance has announced was in relation to tax. Uh, but let me just read you what, 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 because many people look and listen to the budget speech, but they don't study the budget review. So in terms of the budget review, it was said that in December month, there was an automatic inflow of higher taxes, specifically coming from the corporate sector as a result of better commodity prices, but also better um, exchange rate. And it exceeded um, national treasury and SARS's expectation of how much they were supposed to get in. That created a little bit of fiscal space for, 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 for the minister to move a little bit. And now the minister have also announced, and I want each of the panelists to give us a short input on this, of the benefits of having the reduce and planning to reduce the corporate tax. And maybe I must start with Professor Parsons. Well, I think, Dennis, it, it was a positive step. Uh, and it sends symbolically a, a quite an important message that the private sector is being taken seriously uh, in that respect. I applaud it. I think that's, that, that's sending out a good signal. I think we must just qualify, though, by saying that the fine print tells us that certain other allowances and incentives will be phased out. So we don't know whether uh, what the net effect will be. But the fact that symbolically you are wanting to wanting to reduce the, the nominal corporate rate from 28 to 27, I th in fact, percent, that, that's, that's positive. And I think it sends out a positive signal. I would couple it, though, once again, to say that you talk about the fine print. And I think it's important to, as you indicate, that the, the budget speech was about 20 pages, but the review is 220 pages. So it's important <laughs> to look at the fine print. Uh, because not everything uh, could be put into the main speech. When you come to the net impact of the other tax changes, there's more homework to be done. Yes, it's positive to look at certain nominal things changing. But, for example, 
if income tax is, is being eased in some ways, but the fuel levy is going up, that will both affect disposable income. So we don't know yet, right? But the important point is that what the minister is saying, I have room to maneuver. I have room to stabilize the situation to the best of my ability on the tax side as well. So before we, we throw our hats into the air and say, it, you know, this is a net gain, we've just got to do the balancing act. But that doesn't de uh, detract from the positive message that there has been some, some, some room to maneuver and that that room has been used on the tax side rather than on the spending side. And I think, I think, that's, I think that's a positive, albeit marginal, message that has come out of the Better News budget. Yes, Mr. Sandili Songo, you are the um, president of business, Black Business Council. And obviously, we want our companies to be world global champions, you know, in the global environment. So will that tax cuts help them to become more competitive? Well, I, th I think I would like to echo what um, Professor Parsons said, that the devil tends to be in the detail. At a superficial level, just that sweeping statement, corporate tax will be coming down, um, inspires hope and confidence. Um, but once you take away certain incentives, um, the overall, call it um, uh, harmonized or, uh, or hybrid effect is nothing has changed. Um, maybe a disappointment to those who are used to those kind of incentives notwithstanding the fact that the communicated narrative at the budget uh, speech level talks so positively um, should immediately inspire confidence. Guys, South Africa is open for business. Let's gear ourselves for further uh, fixed investment, which is what we need. We don't want hot money, which comes in on, on sound bites. Um, fixed investment for the long, long term becomes a very important. Um, what, what even becomes more inspiring for me is a commitment towards the African uh, uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, people tend to, uh, uh, you know, uh, not focus sufficiently on that. South Africa is a market of 60 million people. North of us in the continent, our continent, including ourselves, is a market of more than a billion people. Uh, businesses throughout the world, in North America, in Asia, in Europe, uh, are seeing Africa as a new frontier. Uh, what are we doing um, to leverage our future growth on ourselves, those who are part of this community. So when the minister says African free, uh, continental free trade agreement um, is something that is of major importance to us, we have actually uh, called it seconded in soft terms, uh, our own to be Secretary General of this. Um, that basically says we as South Africans are, play, are planning for the long game. Um, that to me, when we talk about the, the various hope markers, that's one of the hope markers. So African um, business, black or white, need to trust in their own economy. Yes, we've got a lot of battles to fight. Yes, we've got a lot of uh, issues we should be concerned about. But at the very least, let's trust in our own future and see the budget for what it is as uh, sprinkled with a lot of hope markers that we need to latch on and begin to have confidence into the future uh, whilst we grapple with those the issues that divide us. So overall, um, I think um, there's uh, every reason why corporate South Africa should be confident about the future. Uh, like I said, there's a lot beyond the speech. People are still faced with the same uh, uh, frustrations of the past that it takes a long time to get a water license it takes a long time to get a mining right. It still takes a lot, long time to get a municipality approval. There are plans. Um, and, uh, but must not give up. Um, it takes a long time to wash an elephant, uh, if you're going to do it thoroughly. Um, we'll get there. 
And I think we as social partners, media included, um, need to take our responsibility very seriously because we are about nation building. We are about realizing um, the vision of Madiba uh, when it bequeathed this de democracy to us. We have to be true to that. We uh, must not take eyes, our eyes off the ball. Um, like I said, uh, uh, corporates have every reason to be um, proud about what the kind of future we're building. But uh, we need to still box at NetLack and elsewhere uh, for the details because uh, there are a lot of issues that should be of concern to us. Dennis, I'm Thank very you. glad that Zondili has raised the issue of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement because I think this tends to fall off the table from time to time. It is a very important development. And I would just add that what's important from what I have now seen of development so far is we're hearing from the politicians and indeed from the bureaucrats as to where we are with the negotiations and uh, what progress is being made, what are the obstacles. It's a long-term thing, but what we're starting this year I want to see more visible participation by business in the negotiations. In other words, you could create a framework of tariffs and so forth, but who's got to take the decisions to, to flesh them out? It's business. They've got to take advantage of the tariffs or take advantage of the regulations that have been eased. What input are they making? Now, maybe I'm not aware of the input, but I think you know, we're spending a lot of time and indeed, I know that organized businesses put a lot of inputs on infrastructure, all the kind of issues that were, were embodied in the budget yesterday. But I haven't seen much visibility in sitting down with the bureaucrats and the politicians and saying, this is the business view of this free trade agreement. This is what we would be able to respond to, to make a success of it. So I'm hoping that as we move down the whole negotiation process, not only will it generally enjoy more, more attention, but that business will make more inputs and help to shape the successful conditions you need over time so that we can maximize the strategic value of this, of this continental free trade agreement. It is, it is groundbreaking territory, but we need to ensure that the private sector, that in the end has to make it work is a part of shaping it so that you get the responses. You are shaping an agreement to which business will progressively and aggressively respond over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Parsons. Uh, I would like to ask the panel now, because you know, employment is so very critical for us to deal with poverty and also with inequality. And employment plays a very important role to bring the households in the swing of the economy. So I would like to ask you to use um, each panelist three minutes as part of your concluding remarks, you know, um, supporting what the minister have put on the table through the budget, you know, which is a very critical instrument of fiscal policy, you know, and maybe in the future we're going to speak about monetary policy also. But um, from my side, so let me start with Adri and then three minutes for each of you, and then I'm going to close off the program. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. George. Um, I'll try to be less passionate. Um, you know, um, the previous um, president uh, created the Jobs Fund, which was monitored or managed by the Development Bank, and now it sits under the Treasury. Now, that, at that point in time, it's many years ago, about 9 billion rand was allocated for a Jobs Fund. So I need to go back to the, to the details of the budget to see how much money was relocated to the jobs fund, which was actually there, obviously, to create jobs. So I've um, written a lot of articles about that, trying to get some information from uh, Treasury and so on. But it seems to me like there's no clear indication of how many jobs has been created in what sectors. I just got a very funny feeling that it's, um, it's not monitored uh, in the way that I would like it to be. So, and then I also think my, my few cents worth, as I said earlier on to you, um, to you, is that I think we should also change the narrative a little bit and focus maybe with the Black Business uh, 
council to, 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 to formulate a jobs monitor, we, we actually uh, monitor how many jobs has been created in various sectors, also maybe provincially or so on. Uh, now that commodities this has been very popular and, and our gold mines and platinum mines and so on are doing very well at the moment. But I think that would be just a change of the, the way we look at employment, not always on unemployment. Unemployment is, is a reality, but it's just so negative. If we could just entice companies and industries to employ people and with the help from business to, um, you know, to come up with solutions, how can we create jobs? Um, that that I, would like to, I would like to see happening in the near future. Thank you. Professor Parsons? Yes, I think we know that unemployment, especially when we look at the latest uh, official figures of unemployment, uh, which are at, at indeed record levels, there are two aspects. There's the short-term aspects, and uh, quite a substantial amount of money has been committed in the budget yesterday to deal with short-term job creation. And I think it's important that, that that gets implemented. I mean, implementation is the thread that runs through almost everything that we are saying today. Then the second is the longer term issues. That is the infrastructural development, which needs to provide us with the longer term job rich growth that, that we need. But I want to counsel again that we really need to get on with the things to which we've already been committed. Some of our memories may go back no less than 18 months to a previous job summit. I looked at that document in the last two days again. There were some wonderful things there. Uh, some of them looked rather familiar, uh, but nonetheless, important things that were consolidated in a number of pages on which the social partners had reached agreement. Now, I think we, we can't keep reopening this debate. We know the urgency of the problem. We know that thanks to the pandemic, it has worsened, it has reinforced the fault lines uh, in our economy of unemployment, poverty and inequality. But can we not reinvent the wheel, but go back to that document and make sure that as a supplementary document to the budget speech, it is implemented. And I think many of the things we would have raised here are in that document, have been in several other documents for that matter. So I think the important challenge now, especially with the unemployment situation worsening, we need to tackle that. But above all, we need to understand that if we're going to create expectations that we can create more jobs as this economy expands, as we restructure it, as we underpin it, the fact is that there are a number of conditions that have to be met, that the minister has taken a calculated risk that he will get the growth, that he will get the tax revenues, that he can get the debt levels down. All this feeds into our ability to create an environment in which there will be job-rich growth. And I think it comes back to implementation, not only of what was decided yesterday in the budget, but above all, to ensure that what we already decided at the most recent job summit is visibly implemented. Bring these two together, and then even your other concerns about debt ratios, and about uh, uh, insolvencies and all those issues uh, that the state might run out of money. It's a question of imp what you've got effectively and giving people the hope that there will be more jobs tomorrow than there are today. And I think that's the most important point that we need to bring through as we steer this economy, hopefully into, into better times. Thank you very much, um, Professor, for your concluding remarks. I want to ask the president of Black Business Council, Mr. Zandili Zungo. You know, you've got a very big organization and they've got a very important role to play in South Africa. And I'm glad that you took the opportunity to use this platform, not only just to communicate with the readers of um, the business report, but also to communicate with your own constituency, um, especially in these times. And, and maybe from your side, the kind of role that you foresee BBC will play in the future regarding employment creation. Uh, thank you. Thank you for those remarks, uh, Professor George. Um, I want to start by taking up uh, Adri on uh, the challenge of uh, jobs monitor. Uh, we'll welcome the challenge. 
Um, I think it's a very plausible initiative. Uh, let's change the narrative. Let's focus less on unemployment. Let's focus more on employment. Um, even if it's from a low base, um, companies must be incentivized, must be encouraged uh, to be counted as they create jobs. So the jobs monitor must not only look at quantity, but it looks it must look at quality. There's there's been a a, 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 a perpetual trivialization of jobs. People have been talking about job opportunities. Yes, of course, people need job opportunities, but quality jobs is very important. Uh, there's no point in having someone employed for three weeks. It's job opportunity, and then beyond the expansion of that road. Angala, go and join the unemployed ranks of A. Um, we need to shift the focus. Um, going back to the issue of employment, unemployment is an affront to what Madiba bequeathed to us. Um, it's the it's a biggest impediment to human dignity. Um, worse for young people. You know, it takes it takes a whole village to raise an African child. And it takes a whole village to take the child to university um, and to emerge as a graduate. If you go to any rural village in Venda, and they will tell you uh, girl X or boy X um, that to slaughter a goat uh, when that child went to study at uh, University of the North uh, or Limpopo or to study at um, University of Edwards Rand. And when that child graduates, the whole village ululates because they contributed. And now when you say that child cannot be employed, there are no employment opportunities, it's a smack in the face of the whole village. We've got to address this issue. More than just it being a, 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 a smoldering uh, powder keg um, that explode in our faces anytime soon. Um, it is a human dignity issue. Um, so we need to take it a lot more seriously. And I'm afraid that um, can people, corporates included, um, have been paying lip service to the issue of unemployment, especially youth unemployment. Um, there's got to be a much bigger movement than just the job summit. Uh, there's gonna be a, got to be a much more revolutionary initiative uh, more than just the, 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 uh, it, uh, the, the fund uh, that was, was created. It's got to be uh, uh, organic, it's got to be uh, ground-based. And it goes back to that issue um, of um, what some may call a patronizing reference to township economy. Um, that, you know what? Um, if you're a township entrepreneur and you're looking for credit mm. and you want to create jobs um, in the township such that young graduates can walk from, work, from home to work, um, you are seen as additional risk, very much in the same way that our own um, country and sovereign debt is seen as high risk and therefore imposing limitations to government borrowing simply because the cost of interest um, to that debt is much higher than, for example, in a country like Japan, which can borrow two, time, two three times uh, their GDP because they don't pay any interest on the, on, on the borrowings. Uh, our debt, uh, now that we're in junk status, it means we almost pay close to 10% um, on that debt. That imposes limitations on how much we can borrow and why we cannot over borrow to fund our uh, commitments. Um, if we juxtapose that to an entrepreneur in the township who says, look, um, the, the need is the greatest in the townships, but I'm seen as even a greater risk than someone who operates um, in the south. Uh, why? Why must being an entrepreneur in the township being to be seen as a greater sin? Uh, so we've got to change that narrative such that those who want to become 
entrepreneurs and providers of employment where the need is greatest are rewarded rather than being seen as a curse. Um, and it will take a lot of educating the banks. Um, if you look at some of the banks, the people who are responsible for credit approvals have never been to a township. Um, they, they will see themselves dead before they go to the township. Uh, and yet they're supposed to sit and approve applications from the townships. Um, it's, 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 it's a crime uh, that we are inflicting on ourselves. So in my view, the issue of employment, youth unemployment in particular, needs to be tackled um, in a much more mature, but in a much more frank and candid manner, um, much more than it has been done before. Um, and um, unfortunately, um, you know, it's got to be tackled much sooner than later. Um, because if we don't do that, as some people have said in the past, um, it's a time bomb that is waiting to explode. That's my remark. Thank, thank you very much, uh, President from Black Business Council, uh, Professor Raymond Parsons, and um, Adri Sienekal um, David from Business Report. Uh, thank you very much for all your contributions that you have made this morning. This was now the first of many of these kinds of discussions that we're going to have. I also would like to say thank you, and you will also receive from our side, one of the sponsors decided to give you a, um, a gift pack. It's like a, a gift pack of sanitizers, you know. So it also helps us in the fight against the COVID-19. So it will probably be delivered at your office already or will be delivered, but it comes from the, the sponsors, and, 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 uh, and we thank them also for their contribution. But I think going forward, you know, Audrey, there's a lot of good suggestions that came from here, and the ball is in your court to take us further to make social dialogue not only just in Netlag, but let us bring social dialogue also into the public because all of us have a responsibility in terms of implementing the solutions for our country. But thank you very much, and God bless you. Keep well and keep thank safe. You.